Hello, and welcome to the disability myth. My name is Dominic, and I live with a fatal disease called spinal muscular atrophy. Together, my amazing caretaker, co-host, and best friend, Uriel and I, plan to debunk misconceptions, share our personal experiences, and shatter your expectations. But we're not stopping there. We're bringing in experts, thought leaders, and everyday people who are smashing through societal barriers, paving the way for a more inclusive world. Whether you're tuning in to learn, empathize, or simply to be entertained, the show promises to be an eye-opening experience that transcends boundaries. Because when it comes down to it, what makes us different is what makes us extraordinary. Well, hello world. Welcome back to The Disability Myth. I am your handsome and humble host, of course, Dominic Trevithan. Here with me today is my equally handsome and humble co-host and personal caretaker, Uriel. Now, today's myth is quite the heavy one, and I really wanted to take my time to make sure that we got this right, because it's a myth that touches very close to home for me, and I'm sure that it's something a lot of you out there, disabled or not, can really relate to. Today, we're going to be talking about and hopefully demystifying the burden complex. So um, Dominic and I have been talking about this for like a while and how to approach this episode. We've been going over articles and stuff. Um, we found an article by Dida M. Oliker, a PhD in psychology, who defines the burden complex as something we carry and it's something that is emotionally difficult to bear, a source of great worry or stress, like something something that we carry with us that's causing all this all this pain. Would you say that that's, that's relatable to you? Yeah, no, I think that's a that's a pretty accurate definition that we get from that article. Um, a burden, as Uriel mentioned, is typically thought of as something that we carry, like a kind of a mental weight, right? That we have to bear throughout our lives, maybe. And um, relative to, you know, our show, The Disability Myth, at least in my experiences, a burden complex is something that I've experienced um, with regard to the needs I have on a daily basis and the burden that puts on the people closest to me in my life. So I, I think the real myth that we want to outline and discuss here specifically is the notion that asking for help makes you a burden. And this myth is really troublesome right? Because it perpetuates this idea that seeking assistance from others, even though you might need it, such as in cases like myself, and I'm sure other people with severely limiting physical disabilities, even though we might need help, I think this myth perpetuates the idea that asking for it is inherently negative and burdensome on the people that we seek help from. And it's really tough because when you look at reality, humans are social beings, right? We started as hunter-gatherers, we ventured out, became nomads, and we were able to, I think, establish you know, a society because of our ability to work together as a collective unit that relied on each other. And so in saying that, I think helping one another, being altruistic, is a sort of fundamental aspect of building relationships and communities. With that being said, though, I'll definitely tell you I feel like a burden to those in my life. And that's not because of the people that helped me. It's more so just sometimes the way I can't help but to perceive myself in my world. 
as I've mentioned before, I need help with practically everything. I need someone to get me up in the mornings, to lay me down at night. I need someone to feed me breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Well, not feed me necessarily, but, you know, prepare my meals for me. And um, I need someone to help me use the restroom, of course, too. And so these are all very personal, very time-consuming and somewhat tedious tasks that I need help with. Now, I think where the source of me personally feeling like a burden comes from is kind of a collective result of all these little things I need throughout the day. Right? Like I said, I get up in the mornings, probably around nine on most days, nine o'clock in the morning. And so, you know, my routine goes either my grandfather or Uriel, who's whoever's here, uh, to help me will help me wake up in the morning, help me use the restroom, get dressed, transfer me from my bed to my wheelchair, which as Uriel can vouch for is a whole process, although he does it quite expediently. <laughs> um and so then after I'm up in my chair. I finished getting dressed, put on my shirt, deodorant, got to smell good for the ladies. <laughs> and then uh, I go ahead and do my breathing treatments that I need every 12 hours. And my grandfather helps me with that. Um, so that takes 20 minutes. And then he cooks me breakfast. Usually some like fried eggs, scrambled eggs and bacon or sausage, the old old-fashioned american breakfast for me <laughs> i like my cholesterol <laughs> oh yeah and um the whole process of doing all that is easily an hour and a half two hours depending on how quick we are yeah um and so that's that's how my mornings start you know it's a lot it's a lot of work for my caregiver whoever is helping me complete all those daily activities of living right and that's just the morning at that point after we're done with that it's like 11 o'clock or so usually <clears throat> and i'll kind of start my day by getting on my laptop working on outlines for the podcast doing research listening to other podcasts to kind of get an idea of the flows and formats that i want to try out and um about a few hours later when i'm done doing all that i'm like well, damn i gotta go to the bathroom now and that's like a whole nother thing that i need mm -hmm. help with right my usually it's my grandfather who's here to help me with that so he transfers me from my chair back to my bed amazingly by himself without the assistance of anyone or any machine <laughs> um he's yeah he's he's really strong in more than one way and you know putting me back in the bed, helping me use the restroom, cleaning me up. It's a whole process of like sometimes close to 45 minutes. And then I get back up and get back to whatever I'm doing, right? Mm -hmm. And I bring this example up specifically because I know it's really hard on my grandfather. And, you know, I can tell he 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 loves doing it because he loves me and he cares about me, obviously. But I can tell, you know, it's it's hard on him. It's not easy to lift me. <clears throat> I'm uh about I think 120 pounds or so. About yeah, I'd say so. Big old sack of potatoes, as oh, yeah. he used to call me. And That's um fun. yeah, so it's not easy. I, I recognize that. And so one of the things I will do to limit the help I need throughout the day is I'll purposefully dehydrate myself, right? So that I won't have to go to the restroom as often. Um, right, because you're worried about putting, other people hurting themselves and like having to like go for all that exactly like st strenuous task of like getting you in and out of the bed. Yeah, that's and like you feel bad for other people. I know you've told me that you felt bad whenever i had to lift you because sometimes like you hear me like stretch in and just hear my back just like yep. yeah it's like every time you're real every time you tries to lift me you know by himself without my lift uh he's got to like take five ten minutes and like 
lay down on the floor, stretch out, oh, yeah. pop all of his joints, make sure oh, he's, yeah. he's crispy before he makes the attempt. <laughs> it's more because it's a very... Uh, it's usually way easier and faster with, and like you don't weigh too much, but it's definitely like the way your body's distributed. It could be a little like, yeah, ghetto. So you have to like properly lift you and all that. But we got the, the turkey, the, the curved turkey body, turducken body. Yeah. Yeah. In order to like kind of, kind of get around your, your burden complex and to like have me feeling a bit, feeling a bit better, I've been stepping in more and like using the left as much as possible. But I know like even that is a little annoying because like the lift can be a little like tedious and mm -hmm. take like longer. Yeah. Using the lift we have, it's an Arjo lift, very similar to a Hoyer, which is I think the more com uh, more common name or brand of lift type of lift. Um, It's a little bit easier to use because it has a hydraulic system in it which allows it to like actually lift up and rotate from side to side. Um, so it's really, really a good piece of equipment. <clears throat> it's just, it takes time to get the sling under me. And you, of course, as my caretaker, I have to be careful not to like, you know, pull my leg up too hard or you'll stretch out my contractures and it's a whole thing it's a whole process yeah it's the tedious part of it yeah because um the new like the pneumatic system is a little stiff at times and like sometimes when you push the button there's a bit of a delay on it so i'd be holding it down then it starts moving it's like a little weird sometimes where i don't want to like hit you on accident yeah and we've had times where i've gotten a little bonk here or there but <laughs> no serious injuries yeah yeah well, let's go back to what you said because i think that's really important this yeah in order to like uh, because you don't want to be a burden or kind of like hurt us for for lifting right to the point where you purposely dehydrate yourself yeah and so Could you elaborate on that for others that i think you kind of hit the nail on the head with your initial kind of thoughts that you jumped in with that, you know, lifting me, it's not easy. It's weight on you and it's time consuming. And, you know, with the example with my grandfather, you know, he's, he's in his seventies and he he's amazing, no spring chicken, he's no spring chicken, <laughs> but he amazingly still lifts me. And I can tell when he's in pain, you know, um, Oh, yeah. Like, after I use the restroom, he'll make sure to, like, take a rest, let, sit down on the couch for a few minutes before coming back to transfer me back into my wheelchair. And so it's tough because I know it's not easy on him. And it's something I wish I could do, obviously, for multiple reasons, like just being able to get up on my own would be great. But just for the fact alone that I wish he didn't have to do it. Right. And I know he only lifts you because of how tedious the actual lift it. And like, yeah. There's like, I think, because he's on, on the older side, I think there's like a technological like barrier there for him or just oh. like a little in, like impatience. I don't know about technological barrier. He's He's really smart when it comes to like using technology. I think it's just, you know, he knows I prefer to be lifted physically like manually we'll say okay um just because it's less time consuming and um he knows he can do it but at the same time it's tough for me because i wish he didn't have to right yeah and that going back to what alec says like something that like in the back of your head it's causing like uh, like stress or some sort of anxiety and, uh, and that's it because like you're a you're anxious every time like we lift you manually because it's that fought in the back of your mind where i don't want the people taking care of me to like get injured to the point where they couldn't take care of me for like any amount of period of time and we've discussed about that there's like a whole domino effect there right because right. if my caretaker gets hurt taking care of me then who else is going to take care of me, right? Right. I live 
I live in a pretty remote area where there's not a lot of, you know, nursing available or nurses that want to come. So, yeah, it's kind of awkward because it's not like I live in a place that's super populated or metropolitan like Los Angeles. And even in L.A., when I was living there at UCLA, um, I had issues getting nurses, too. So that kind of idea of my nurses or caregivers getting hurt is really scary to me because then I'll really be, you know, uh, isolated and in a position where I won't have the help I need because the help I need is hurt. And that kind of compounds that burden complex for me. Another kind of thing that I noticed too is when my grandparents are like sitting down or they're comfortable or even my nurse Uriel for instance like he's my my caretaker but he's also you know my best friend and so I care about him too and so if I see him laying down or just chilling uh at my house uh, at times I'll even feel bad for asking him for help more so with my grandparents for sure because of their age but you know I just feel bad because if I see someone comfortable sitting down, chilling, I I don't want to interrupt them, their peace, right? Just to like help me with some little thing like getting my PS5 controller. <laughs> it's 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 a lot of little things like that that kind of compound together throughout the day. Where now if I if I notice like my grandparents are tired or they've had a long day and I'm playing a video game at night or something i'll purposefully turn off my controller when i'm not using it so that the battery doesn't die as quickly and i don't have to ask for help to charge it because the charger they have to get up come back here in the bedroom bend down to get the other one unplug it plug in my current one i'm using plug in the old one right and then put it back down uh, where i keep all my gaming stuff lower to the floor for some reason <laughs> and then they have to you know walk back into the other room it's a whole thing and i just i wish they didn't have to do all that so it feels like because because you have because you feel like a burden you figure out small little ways throughout your yeah. daily routine to essentially like limit that burden you feel right to limit the help i need from them which sequentially limits my sense of feeling like a burden to them right. another prime example um i need help to grab the remote that i drive my wheelchair with it's like on a bar that sticks to the side of sticks out to the side of me and my sma has gotten to the point now over the past year or two where I can't pull it down anymore in front of me to be able to drive. So what I'll do sometimes, I'll awkwardly reach to my side and try to drive with it up to the side of me. I'll grab my joystick and try awkwardly driving to the dresser that's in this room that I'm in or like a counter, whichever room I'm in. I try to find something that's relatively higher up. And what I'll do it's kind of awkward or weird to explain, but I'll elevate using my chair's hydraulics so that I'm higher than the dresser or the counter. And then what I'll do is I'll drive right next to it in such a way that the controller for my chair is above it. That way I can de-elevate pushing the controller up to a position where I can grab it and pull it down. And that mm. that whole process is it takes me sometimes 10, 15 minutes just to pull it down to be able to drive. I never even did that. It's pretty innovative. It's just like you said, you know, just little things right. that I try to do to limit the help I need from others. So But it could also be a little detrimental to yourself at times. Like the way you like purposely dehydrated yourself, like mm -hmm. stated earlier, because you don't want to go to the bathroom as often. We could see that as almost a bit of like self harm in a way. Yeah, I, I could see that. Um, and you know, 
I get my blood work done and urine checked pretty regularly because of my Spinraza injections that I get. So I have a pretty good idea usually of how, you know, if if what I'm doing is hurting my body in such a way that it would show up in my results, then I would know. And so I kind of rest easy knowing that. But still, the fact of the matter is I dehydrate myself purposefully, which is, <laughs> it's not good. And I know that. Um, it's just kind of the way I live my life at this point in time. Um, I don't feel dehydrated usually. Um, in the mornings, I drink a big old cup of coffee, right? And <laughs> that dehydrates me even more. Oh, yeah, it's a diuretic. <laughs> And then um, I don't usually drink anything else until like five or six at night when we have dinner, um, because that way I only have to go once in the afternoon. And then I don't go again until I go to sleep and get back in bed anyways. So there's no need for an extra lift if I'm just going back to bed for the night. Hmm. Um, but yeah, no. it's, uh, it's definitely not healthy. Now, how do you think? would be the best way to um, to prevent that kind of counteract that do you feel like there's no clear cut way to do it is it just more nursing yeah i don't feel like there's a super clear cut easy way to fix that problem at this point in time i've tried using like condom catheters before um and the issue with those is I can't get one to like stick to me per, like for a long period of time. Um, it's pretty self-explanatory. I don't want to go into details, get a little too TMI <laughs> for the podcast, but you know, it's a condom that you wear. But the problem I experienced with it is it would leak when I try to use it because it would just get loose from me. And so instead of going my urine going through the catheter to the like the little plastic bag that's attached to it it would just spill on me and so that's no good that's a sanitary issue it's, yeah it's, that's another issue yeah yeah and it just doesn't feel good being on yourself it's not it's not a generally good experience yeah i bet <laughs> okay it's 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 tough because like i'm like in this middle space between being severely physically disabled but somewhat not in a way. Most people in chairs, they can't control their bladders or like feel below their waist. I'm a little different because of my SMA. It doesn't really affect <clears throat> my bladder control or my like sense of like feeling or sensation. It's just I can't physically go to the bathroom whenever I want without someone else helping me. Right. No. I'm gonna change a little. Still on the same on the same trajectory, but I'm gonna ask because we go out in public quite often, mm -hmm. and I've asked you these before, but I think they're important to bring up, especially for those with disabilities that do happen that do go out in public, right? And it's this idea of do you ever feel like a burden to others in public? Um. I don't think about it too often, so I want to say no. But there's times where I do kind of feel awkward out in public. Like, obviously, as anybody in a chair with a disability will probably tell you, we live in a world that's that's not, you know, perfected for someone with a mobility aid. Right. There's, there's a, ADA is great, and we've made a lot of progress as a country to, like, accommodate for people in chairs um there's ramps of course on pretty much every sidewalk now which is awesome but then at times there's instances where i feel kind of awkward or out of place because i'll be going on a sidewalk driving my chair and there's like a big old tree plot in the middle of the sidewalk and so i'll have to kind of find a nearby drive driveway or like a ramp to get off the sidewalk I'll have to drive on the street and then get back up on the sidewalk once I'm past the tree, for instance, so I can get back up on the sidewalk. But it's just awkward. And I feel 
weird about it because I don't, you know, generally want to be in the street. Like, yeah, you wouldn't see a person just walking on the street in most cases, right? Um, and then it creates issues. It creates issues too because what if I'm like holding up traffic, right? Because I have to drive in the street. Like, I, now that's kind of burdensome, right? <laughs> that happens to us a few times. Yeah. Yeah. It's just like, well, I can't even imagine for those that don't have the ability that are in a wheelchair and might struggle to like get over certain obstacles, like the, the classic tree on the walkway situation. So that someone's caretaker or like a loved one or a relative would have to like push him over or help him maneuver certain obstacles. Yeah. Like, and I've talked about this before um, when we were when I did my presentation at the local wine bar, um, cracks in the sidewalk are a big issue for people in chairs. Whether you're in a power chair or a manual push chair, because it's a bump, right? And that bump, you may or may not be able to get over with your chair. If you're pushing, it's going to be extremely hard because you have to push even harder to get over that little bump. And a lot of times it's because of stuff like roots and trees I've noticed yeah. that are overgrown under the sidewalk. And so it's just awkward because you have to kind of slow down, mentally prepare yourself for this bump, and then hope that you can get over it. Because if you can't, then again, you have to kind of get off the sidewalk somewhere, and go on the street, and come back. Hmm. Now, um... Are there any exercises or mental fortitude exercises that you do to like help yourself calm down in situations like that? Let's say like when we go out in public and people have to like move chairs, like step aside to accommodate for you. Does it ever get to you like mentally? It it does. And I feel like I just become like a super goody two shoes <laughs> and I just say thank you a lot. I feel. Uh, I catch myself saying, thank you. I really appreciate it. You know, I try to express my gratitude as vocally as I can in situations where, you know, I'm being waited on or people are moving stuff for me to, so that I can take up a space in a building. Like for example, when we go to the wine bar, that place is crowded and sometimes depends. And, you know, it's just, there's chairs everywhere, tables, it's, it's an obstacle course in there, but at the same time, the owners are super awesome and they're great about moving stuff out of the way for us so that I can kind of drive where I want to, to park my chair and sit. Um, whether it's like at the bar or like at a table, they'll move chairs, they'll move the little microphone setup they have in there um, just to accommodate me. And it's always awkward for me because again, like I feel like a burden like i don't want people to have to change their whole setup because of just me and i think the way i kind of make myself feel okay with it is by just like i said expressing my gratitude saying thank you because what else am i gonna do right right well it's also um because sometimes I have this issue too where people will do really nice things for me and I become a little over apologetic or a little, I put myself in in this weird thought process where like, oh, I didn't deserve it. Mm-hmm. But at the same time, it's important to kind of rechange that thinking process and not see acts of kindness or just like good deeds as this oh, I didn't deserve it. Oh, you know, like that, that, because mm-hmm. I feel like that seeing the world like that's a little negative. Yeah, it's tough because, you know, as an individual, I feel that I should have the right to kind of sit where I want in a room, right? It's, pub- it's a public space. Mm-hmm. Then at the same time, I battle with this burden complex where I wish I could just kind of go into a room and not suddenly attract the attention of every person because of all the help I need, right? To move something out of the way or like people will be like, oh, well, let me scoot up when I'm trying to get behind them. 
it's just like ugh, I just it feels awkward, you know. And But at the same time, it's like not getting hung up with it's like it's the right thing to do and people are being accommodating exactly and it's that's like no need to like dig further into it. You yeah, know, it's that's like no need to overcomplicate it. It's just it just works. sometimes it's just people being genuinely, you know, respectful and like nice human beings. Right. It's Which is like kind of like like you said, there's no need to dig deeper than that. Right. But I know it's hard not to dig deeper, Yeah. giving some people situations and like this idea of burden or being a burden. It's hard not sometimes not to kind of like spiral into that thought. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. And I, I think what kind of compounds this issue for me specifically, um, and I, I'm only aware of this because I studied it a bit uh, in my communication courses, um, this idea that people from different countries or different ethnicities fall into one of two categories when it comes to how they um, look at themselves and their place in the world. Um, this battle between individualism and collectivism exists. And it's actually quite, quite well studied at this point. There was a um, scientist, Hofstede, that created this cultural dimensions theory back in the 80s, where he, he researched people's values in the workplace and created all these different scales upon which he could grade them as a culture. And so one of them is individualism versus collectivism. So the difference here between these two is that collectivist societies place greater importance on the goals and well-being of the group with the person's self-image in this category aligning more with we, right? We as a group, not I, but we. People from collectivistic cultures tend to emphasize relationships and loyalty more than those from individualistic cultures, right? And so I think a lot of these cultures typically are um, South American cultures, um, Asian cultures. They place, they place a high priority on the group, a higher priority on the group than Mm. individualistic cultures, such as, right, such as the United States, right? Here in the, in the States, we are an individualistic society. I'd say we're probably kings at that, right? Probably What's that? like we're probably kings at that, right? Right, Probably like right. top, like probably easily top five, I think. Right, right. And, you know, this is, this is not a matter of opinion. This is, this has been researched and studied over the past 40 years, right? Individualistic societies, such as the States, we tend to stress achievement and individual rights, focusing on the needs of oneself or one's immediate family. And so this compounds my burden complex, I think, because I grew up thinking I have to be something. I have to do something with my life, right? I always saw myself growing up, and I still do, as a normal person, that needs to accomplish something and make a name for myself. And so that kind of compounds my burden complex because I don't want the help of others to be able to accomplish something myself. Mm, right. And I feel like that thought process, not to go like too far away from the subject, but I feel like that individualism has very, has put a lot of stress and weight on the shoulders of a lot of young people, disabled people. Like I know me included with this individualistic idea where I need to do all these things and have all these things and do all these things by myself could lead to detrimental like uh, like mental health problems Right, and and that's, a, and a lot of young people yeah, and exactly, boom, you've kind of proven the point, right? Disabled or not, it's something that people across the spectrum of mobility, I think, tend to deal with, especially here in the States, because of the pressure we feel to accomplish something. and it's this um societal pressure and this individualistic like 
ideology that I feel creates this highly competitive and like comparative society here in America. And I feel like that greatly contributes to the burden complexes of like able-bodied people like me and also disabled people like you, where you have to, because people in a disability, they're placed in a system in society where they have to compete with everybody. And then people are constantly comparing themselves and that just creates, I feel this just like greatly exaggerates this like burden complex that people might come across or develop. Yeah, no, that's a, that's a good point. Um, we do live in a comparative society too, right? Um, with the advent of social media, we're always looking to others and placing our standards based on what we see from others. And with the mass amount of media that we take in on, da on a daily basis, and especially now more than before, from a young age too, it's all it compounds each other right our 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 need to compare ourselves to the people next to us we can't help but see them and think wow could i be doing as much as them could i be better than them right and i've always kind of felt awkward as a person living with a disability with this regard because when i was younger i kind of had the excuse in the back of my mind that because I am different, I don't need to compare myself to others, you know? Like, I'm in a wheelchair. I, society has placed no expectations on my back, right? Right. But at the same time, that individualism kind of kicks in, and I can't help but feel the need to be better, Right. It's like this innate desire to be competitive, like you said, and to accomplish something that others cannot say that they have. To kind of tie back to the individualism, you know, a person's self-image in this kind of category is defined as I, as opposed to we, right? Right. And so that kind of brings in another interesting kind of dialectical tension that I have experienced um, because again I feel that individualistic pressure to stand out and do something make a name for myself but at the same time I have to act collectively because of my disability specifically because I require so much help you know if you include my grandparents in the total then the total number of caretakers that I have to communicate with on pretty much a daily basis at this point in my life is like five. Right. And that's the thing about dis being disabled or living with a disability is that it's not just I, it's we. Because I cannot live just by myself. I require the help of others mm -hmm. and so at the same time even though i'm trying to make a name for myself and do stuff on my own there's that dialectical tension present of i need to communicate with people and rely on others so that i can make a name for myself well and i think that's kind of a beautiful way to to look at it because um i've noticed this trend just when speaking to other young people where they usually say the word I, 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 you know, or you give them like an opinion or, or an example. I was like, well, I, well, in my, in my experience, you know, it's very individualistic and mm -hmm. nobody's really thinking about others in the sense where, um, everyone's trying to do their career, everything like on their own as much as possible. And then they burn out. Mm -hmm. Right. And I feel it's very important to kind of be grateful and start, start to feel a little bit better about reaching out for help and realizing that sometimes you can't do it all on your own. 
And like we learned that where we tried to do it. Well, you tried to do the show on yourself at first, and then you asked me for help, and then we started asking other people for help, and then we started learning and just like being better at it. And I feel, well, that's pretty collective, but it's like this trying to get over this almost self-harming individualistic like idea and trying to like better ourselves for other people. We'll always try, well, individualistic, we're trying to improve ourselves, obviously, as best we can, but also improve the relationships with those around us in order to get ahead. Yeah, I, I'm of the opinion too that two heads is better than one of course more specifically right. that when people work as a collective as a group as a unit and i don't think this is really opinion more than a matter of fact human beings are more efficient and productive when they work together right what are ways in your like what are ways you think we can encounter this burden complex or what are things that you do to help get over it yeah and this, this is like another kind of topic i studied a little bit with my pre-psych background and communication background um one of the things that is really helpful i find is cognitive reframing which sounds really fancy but it's very easy to do where you first have to be mindful enough to catch any negative thoughts you may be having about yourself. In my case, you know, um, I feel like a burden because of all the help I need to say, go to the restroom and the, the, the pain it causes my grandfather or the discomfort. I have to be able to be mindful enough to catch those thoughts and check them when, when they, when they come into my mind. Right. Right. And so to check them, one of the things that I like to do that I learned a long time ago is to say, it's just a thought. Just a thought. Right. It doesn't mean anything because it's not real. It's just a thought. And I think another way we can kind of counter these um, negative feelings about ourselves or our burdens, our sense of feeling like a burden is to give ourselves more credit. For instance, like you're always hyping me up about how much I manage on a daily basis. Yeah, it's my, a lot. My care and working on the podcast, um, going to school when I was in school. Um, it's a lot. And so one of my issues is I don't give myself enough credit sometimes. Um, and that's that's again something that you can kind of be mindful of. Right. Think about all the things that you do on a daily basis that result in you being able to live a happy and healthy life and give yourself credit for that. And it's also important to like try to like avoid to check yourself and realize that the people like your caregivers, me included, are there to help. Because A, we care about you, mm -hmm. right? And it's like really, even though we might look like a little discomforted or like a little like annoyed, it's never directed towards you. You know, it yeah. might just be like, oh, like. Yeah. And something especially that helps me with regard to our personal situation where you're my friend and my caregiver is the fact that you get paid to take care of me now, like through IHSS. Yeah. And so I pushed, I pushed pretty hard to like get that set up, right? Back right. When you started helping me out just to help me out like last October. Oh yeah. We were doing it for like almost four months of just like me, just like yeah. coming over what felt like almost every other day. Just to kind of sleep over, help me out in the mornings, get me ready for the day. And, you know, for a long time, Uriel did that just to do it because he's my friend and he cares about me. And so one of the ways that I was able to kind of counter my negative feelings about myself and feeling like a burden with that situation was by pushing myself to get him signed up with IHSS so that he could be paid to like spend time with me and help me out. Because 
you know, otherwise he's just kind of coming over here to help me out, to help me out. And I would have gotten into like this sinkhole of negative thoughts about myself. And so I was able to recognize that beforehand by being mindful of it and thinking of ways I could, you know, counter that. Like in that case of, you know, researching IHSSS and getting all set up with them and encouraging him to do it too. So Mm -hmm. at times I think one of the best ways to counter that burden complex um, on top of giving yourself more credit is taking the time to really think of ways that you can help yourself and help the people that are helping you. Ooh, it's also like um, not to not to be silent as well. I feel like communication plays a huge, a key role. Yes. And a lot of this, like being like very vocal with yourself and honest with yourself and vocal and honest with those around you. That mm-hmm. way, like everybody's in agreement on what needs to be done. That way, no. That way, no party feels unheard or kind of what's the term? Ignored. Ignored. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's perfect. Um, obviously, the goal of kind of cognitive reframing and being mindful is to reach a shift in perspective and i don't think it really matters how you reach that shift in perspective as long as you're able to do it and you know just so happens one of the best ways to do it is to advocate for yourself and communicate because by reframing how we view our place in the world and think about the choices that others make to help us too we can kind of become to see ourselves as worthy of that help. I feel worthy of Uriel's help because I took the time to set it up so that he could get paid to help me. You know, doing all the research, making all the phone calls, uh, going to the doctor's appointment to get it approved, filling out all the paperwork. It's all stuff that I did so that I would feel better about him helping me. Regardless, it's still important to keep in mind that his choice to help me was just that. It was his choice. And so I think those are things that we have to keep in mind, too, when placing that burden on ourselves, right? Right. So I think I think it's safe to say we can consider that myth busted, right? Yeah. I uh, I think at this point in time, the myth that asking for help makes you a burden is just that it's a myth. It's a thought. Right. It's just kind of these, these like collective negative thoughts that we like kind of place on ourselves that we need to dispel or rethink or reframe. Yep. By reframing, by questioning our own thoughts that are happen to be negative by being able to check them and act on them and advocate for ourselves, it can definitely say that it's just a myth. So myth busted. (laughs) Be sure to be vocal and advocate for yourself, right? I think those are the main takeaways here. If you ever feel like a burden, practice those strategies of reframing and being mindful. Those are some of your best tools. And if you liked what we had to say today, please consider leaving a rating. Five out of five stars if you liked it. No rating if you didn't. (laughs) Of course, share with your friends and demystify with others. Peace and love, and may the Force be with you.